Hello, everyone. It is really a pleasure to be here with all of you, and thank you for making all those things up about me. <laughs> I'm really happy to connect with you because uh, for all of my life, I perceived a disconnect, even as a little kid, between religious values, spirituality, people who were um, uh, saying they were spiritual, and prejudice people who looked down or devalued or mistreated others. Even as a little kid, I could never make that connection. So when it came time to do some research for my uh, doctoral dissertation here at Lehigh many years ago, and it's actually how I lost my hair, I um, chose prejudice and religious values. And um, by the end of those five years here, I was really so sick of that topic, but now I rejoice that I have that background and that I've added to it and so forth because I think it is very relevant. Um, we do tend to put people into categories, events, situations into categories, and I know that there is a uh, biological base for that. There we go. Uh, no? I, I know I can do this. That's me. Good. Um, there's a biological base for doing that. It's kind of like a cognitive shorthand. It, it, makes, it allows us to process information a little bit better. Where we get into trouble is when it gets concretized, when it gets put in stone, and when we start to evaluate and devalue groups because of it. Paul Bloom, a uh, TED speaker and a psychologist, uh, says that prejudice and bias are natural, they're often rational, and they're often even moral. And I think that once we understand this, we're in a better position to make sense of them when they go wrong, and they certainly do. So it's one thing to kind of organize our thoughts, and it's quite another to put them into concrete. I found a, a construct, an idea called the intrinsic-extrinsic religious orientation scale that helped me to do some of my research. And uh, intrinsic, as you can imagine, means having internalized, say, the values of the Koran, the Gospel, the Jewish Bible, whatever it is. And you could put philosophy in here where I say religion at times because it's this similar idea. What is it that, that motivates us in life? And you go from that uh, internalized value situation over to the externalized value situation where the letter of the law. And uh, those folks uh, tend to use um, religion more as a, a tool, uh, maybe for social status, for solace, uh, something like that. So one tries to live, the other group tends a little bit more to kind of see what they can get from it. So now, even as I say this, this is a question for the audience. Are you beginning to form a little bit of a bias already? Like, I don't think I like those intrinsically oriented people very much. And that's okay if you're thinking a little bit about it because the, the cement is still wet. It's not uh, firm, it's not solid. You're just kind of processing a little bit. And it may or may not pan out to be true, but that's the beginnings of our biases, of our prejudices. So we have to be really careful because we all do it. We all, not wanting to be, but we all have our prejudices, and we all experience prejudice. This intrinsic, ex extrinsic uh, valuing stuff correlates with uh, certain qualities. Intrinsically oriented people are far less prejudiced. They do not prejudge. They try to take people as they find them. They have more transcendent experiences. They um, will have a sense of something beyond, be it through nature, be it through a sense of God, higher power, whatever. Um, <coughs> once in a while, not that it's something, they're not mystics, it happens to every day, but they tend to have that a little bit more. And what I find particularly interesting is that uh, their levels of moral development tend to evolve. We're all born into a, a level of moral development called reward and punishment. If we're good, uh, we're told you're, you're, you're going to get ice cream or a donut in my case, because I like them. If you're bad, uh, you're going to go to the timeout room. And then, boy, with religion, we can really get into like heaven and hell and what's going to happen with that. Really scary. Um, and uh, the middle level of moral development that hopefully we grow into is uh, uh, conventional thinking, you might call it. Conventional meaning that uh, we look for uh, 
what uh, does society ask of us? What uh, do our, uh, our parents want? What do teachers say? What does church say? And then we, we work to kind of uh, live in, in, in that spirit. And then there's a third level, and this is the dicey part, and hopefully we're there sometimes. We can uh, drift in and out of any of these levels. That's uh, very dangerous because some of those people that really hang out there, the level of principle, of conscience, of doing what we believe, whether church or state agrees or disagrees, they, they wind up getting killed. It gets a little old, you know? So you look at the, like the, the, the prophets in the Jewish Bible, uh, <coughs> Jesus, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, uh, all major struggles just for being who they were. The very fact that they were who they were really um, unsettles people. They don't even have to open their mouth. It makes me think of St. Francis of Assisi, who said to one of his friars, Brother, let's go out and preach. And they, they walked all around and came back and didn't say anything. And the little novice said, uh, Well, what, we didn't do any preaching. He said, If necessary, use words. So the power of our behavior is what's so important of our attitude. A group that is uh, uh, someone we, we need to watch out for a little bit more and not become ourselves is the indiscriminately pro-religious. In the research, it's people who, if it's about religion, I'm all for it. You give them a, a questionnaire or some kind of measurement, they love it. They have not thought through anything or put it into their, their heart and mind. They haven't struggled with it. Uh, those people are the most difficult of all to, to work with. Um, we have a, a, a tendency in any of our groups, uh, particularly in more prejudicial groups, to find heretics, outsiders, infidels. And then what do we do? Well, we, we kill them, or we torture them, or we ostracize them, that sort of thing. And we can all experience it. I've, I've experienced it. Not, not uh, you know, and I have no... No problem with it. But one time I was speaking at a conference for people of color, as it, as it was called. I was one of the one or two pale faces there. And I was honored to be there. It was delightful. I sat down at lunch, and there was a gentleman there, a TV reporter with a camera. And I sat down across from me, happened to be African American. And uh, he looked at me and said, What are you doing here? I was kind of startled. I didn't know what to say. So I said, well, Dr. Brisbane invited me. She runs this thing. She's at Stony Brook University. And then he said, my grandmother was a Christian. And all she did was see bad stuff in the world and focus on that. And I thought, is that what you're doing with your camera and with your reporting? But, but I don't know him. Let's just uh, see where it goes. You, you don't want to react. You want to respond to things. Don't react. Respond. And uh, so I, uh, I kept quiet. And, so, you know, well, I guess we'll try to do a little bit of what we can. I know it's a slow process or something. And we finished our meal awkwardly and left. Later in the afternoon, I was at another conference at, at that same uh, workshop at that same conference. And there was a wonderful old black lady there who was from the South. And uh, as a young woman, whenever she tried to vote as a young woman, go to vote, she would be beaten up. She would be jailed. She would be given phony, forced gynecological exams. It was a horror. And she um, later wrote a book, and later was elected mayor of that town. So um, her friend was there sitting on the dais, uh, who happened to be a white lady. And they wrote the book together, and they were delightful friends. They were funny, they were joking, and all of that. And we were really into this thing. And then I felt a presence, and I looked over, and there was that TV reporter. And he just looked down at me, and he kind of said, like, I get it. It was pretty wonderful. Um, so we want to go to pseudo bliss now because we touched upon prejudice and we touched upon religious values. Pseudo bliss, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> well, um, if people use their spirituality or their meditation just to kind of avoid reality, I call that pseudo bliss. Um, some people come to me and we use mind-body kinds of things uh, such as uh, meditation, hypnosis, etc. Uh, to help with physical illnesses or emotional illnesses. And some come because they want a kind of a closer walk with the Lord, and we call that spiritual direction or with their own understanding of God. But um, sometimes people will come and it's pretty obvious that they want to be taught some technique to block out reality, to block out life, because it hurts too much. And I respect the pain, but I think our spirituality, our philosophy has to transform us. It has to go in. It has to make us get dirty sometimes. Pope Francis says we have to smell, <clears throat> smell like the sheep that we work with. 
So uh, that is what I mean by pseudo bliss. Uh, examples of that, there's an old book. I love the title. I don't even remember what's in the book. It's called When God is a Drug. Spirituality, uh, God can, can uh, or concepts of God can be just as addictive as anything else. So you might wonder, well, what do I do? What don't I do? By their fruits you will know them, Jesus said. So look at the results of your philosophy, of your meditation. Does it bring new life? Does it help? Does it pull people together? Does it pull people apart? What can we do about all of this? Uh, and here's a few little uh, suggestions. Above all, don't rash generalize. Uh, those of you who are philosophy folks, uh, logic people, uh, debaters, you know rash generalization is a big no-no. Uh, rash meaning quickly and generalize, painting everybody with the same brush. Thinking that this person or this group or this event is a representative sample of everything. Try to put a face on uh, what you're experiencing. Get to know people who are different from us. Just by an attitude of openness, that will happen. If you're in the presence of uh, uh, prejudicial remarks or something that's negative, um, gently respond. Choose your battles, though. If you respond to everything, you're gonna, people will go deaf. And they'll like, oh, she's always playing the race card. He's always playing the religion card. Uh, that person's always playing the sex card, whatever it is. So choose your battles and don't move hatred around. There's enough of that to go around. And one <coughs> oppressed group then oppresses another group. One oppressed person oppresses another person. It's hard not to, but don't do it. Try not to do it. And uh, ask for any help you can. I, uh, I do what I can to uh, help get rid of some prejudices. Uh, one of my little pet projects is telehealth, using uh, electronic uh, health care, uh, because it's very clear that people of color and poor people are clearly underrepresented in their ability to get any kind of uh, health care. And, and in my case, I try not to be prejudiced toward extrinsically oriented people. Because when I get beyond that and I get to know them, it turns out it's often, it's often a pretty wonderful experience. A couple quotes to wrap everything up with is, as long as we do not permit God, higher powers, love to consume us entirely and to unite us in God's self, the gold that is in us will be hidden by the rock and the dirt which keeps us apart. We are darkness and we are light. That's from Thomas <coughs> And the last uh, slide is a picture of me in Hong Kong. I'm the one right in the front row about the 17th candle over. <laughs> there I am. Um, that was when uh, we were trying to get uh, the uh, government to represent the massacres at Tiananmen Square a little better in textbooks. The quote says, all through love, nothing through fear. Jane and Francis are my spiritual mother and father and my spiritual order and community. And that's what I encourage us to do, to do all through love, nothing through fear, because I think it, this is all fear-based. All through love, nothing through fear. Uh, and uh, then I wish that same thing, that others would treat you in that same way. Thank you very much.